I think the recording has started. Dr. Shaheen, you so can good start. Good morning to all of you. <laughs> good morning. Uh, the voice is audible, Rudra. Yes, sir. Hello. The voice is audible, sir. Recording yeah. already starts. So can I start? Hello. Should we start now? Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Your voice is audible. Sir, can I start? This is Devo. Should we start? Yes, sir. Please start. Hello. Yes, uh, Doctor Shine, please start. Okay, okay, start? okay. I am. Hello. Okay. Sir. Hello. Fine. Should we start? Yes, sir. Voice please start, sir. Please start. Please start. Okay, sir. Okay. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Miss Tripti Deo, ma'am, Professor Mishra, and uh, my dear learners. Uh, today, topic is about Indian National Movement from 1750 to 1950. This topic are uh, so interesting and it's a vast. So um, I will not take much time, and uh, I'll request to ma'am uh, to start the class and. Uh, i just uh, telling some some of some in intro of this uh, topic that uh, you know, with the formation of indian national congress in 1885 there was a start of the our uh, freedom struggle and the period from 1885 to 1905 was uh, known as the era of moderates where the leaders like uh, umesh chandra banerji gopal krishna gokhale dada bhai nehru ji Pirosha Mehta, Badruddin Tayyab ji, and others put emphasis on prayer, petition, and protest. But uh, their ideology was uh, relegated, uh, uh, relegated to background where the extremists like Bal Gangadhar Tilak, Bipin Chandra Pal, uh, Lala Lajpat Rai emerged between in 1906 and 1919. The period was known as the era of extremists. So. From 1919 to 1947, there witnessed the emergence of Mahatma Gandhi in Indian freedom struggle, and uh, that period was famous as the Gandhian era. And Mahatma Gandhi launched three movement against the British, and that was popularly known as Non-Cooperation Movement in 1920, Civil Disobedience Movement in 1930, and Quit India Movement in 1942. So. let me tell about the non cooperation movement the non cooperation movement of 1920 that was begun by mahatma gandhi and it was a struggle against the british raj in india where the rawlat act and the Jal jallianabad massacre in 1919 prompted mahatma gandhi to launch the non cooperation movement against the british in india and uh, then came about the civil disobedience movement that was uh, on uh, on 12 march on 12 march 1913 on uh, 12 march 1930 our begin the historic dandi march and uh, where there are 78 volunteers and uh, gandhi started his journey from sabarmati ashram to dandi that was 200 miles away on the coast of gujarat and he got overwhelming support from the people on the from the people and uh, lastly i would li like to say about the quit india movement so on 14 august 1942 a meeting was held that was uh, in front of uh, revensa college by the student uh, leaders like uh, bibu dendra mishra surajmal shah biren mitra ashok das and many others and they condemned the arrest of congress leaders by the police they set fire in the college office and were arrested by the police and the people wanted to recapture the seva ghar and ashram it was established by gopabandhu choudhary at bari from the clutch of police but it was raised in ground 
so the 1930 gandhi started the civil disobedience movement in india against the british by marching from sabarmati to dandi and breaking the salt law he was arrested and sent to jail and after gandhi irwin packed he was released from the jail and went to participate in the second round table conference that was held in london in 1931 and he boycotted the third round table conference but the british government quelled this rebellion and uh, after this we will uh, move to uh, how uh, how after long struggle india got uh, independence uh, before that the partition and how the dominion constitutions were uh, come into being so now i am requesting ms tripti view ma'am to please start the class okay. ma'am please thank you dr shaheen for the introduction you, and um, after hearing your introduction i just uh, thought of um, you know i was just trying to rework my uh, class uh, lecture today and i guess i'm going to speak more on the first and the third and the fourth topic so uh, let me just bring my slide to you good morning everyone and welcome to our um, our uh, lecture today which is uh, primarily on the national movement and it's a it's a it's a long it's a vast topic uh, it's humanly impossible to cover the national movement in uh, in about an hour's time but no, no problem, no, no. i will only focus on no, some no, no. points that will bring in um, Uh, some information and broad uh, highlights of the entire national movement so we will be looking at international movement uh, primarily uh, 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 with the with uh, keeping in mind these three broad uh, these four broad themes and this would be uh, the politics of moderates and extremists 1885 to 1920 we will also take a look at um, gandhian mass movement which we in which we will look at uh, non cooperation civil disobedience and quit india movement so i think in a lot of details has already been given by uh, dr shaheen in her um, introduction uh, to the topic so i'm going to cover less of this it's also quite familiar to all of you we've been reading about it we've been we've studied this a lot so i i guess i can overlook this uh, a lot of details that will come in in this particular uh, topic the third uh, important uh, topic uh, of this particular uh, block is communal politics and partition and uh, we will look at how um, uh, we will see that how communal uh, politics uh, that we still struggle with in india today uh, is uh, where did it find its beginning and uh, why the communal politics eventually led to the tragic partition of india and uh, after that the uh, after the independence uh, what were the processes of making of the democratic constitution the last topic so i'm going to try and focus uh, broadly cover all topics but try and focus on the first sec uh, third and the fourth unit let's begin with the politics of moderates and extremists now um, the politics of moderates and now so so uh, we're now in the 19th and the 20th century we are um, uh, not looking at the 18th century that much but uh, because your topic is uh, the the broadly the the the, um, the timeline that uh, we're supposed to cover is 1750 to 1950 but in today's lecture we will try and focus more on the national movement so things related to the national issues related to the national movement is something that i'm going to try and uh, give my insight on now the politics of moderates and extremists um, what were these moderates and what were their methodology all of that is something that we are going to see in this in this in, in the next few slides from now so from 1885 to 1920 what was the role and the nature of the moderates the first session at bombay in 1885 where only 72 delegates participated among the so both moderates and extremists were the part of the indian national congress there were two divisions basically uh, as in they were not two clear divisions but yes they were um, they were on one hand uh, a moderates group of group of leaders and they were on the other hand extremist group of leaders so we will see how extremists really came in later when it all started it was just about the 72 delegates that um, uh, got together in the first session of bombay of the indian national congress now among them professional classes lawyers were dominant groups as far as the castes are concerned brahmins were larger in number 
the masses and the landed classes were absent and congress was mostly a middle class affair all right so this was uh, in 1885 when the first session of bombay india national congress took place now this was the scenario it was a small group about 72 delegates mostly professional classes mostly brahmins and if you look at the caste uh, in terms of the caste um, um, participation masses and landed classes were absent and congress was mostly a middle class affair keep that in your mind now who were these moderates congress politics for the first 20 years from 1885 to 1905 were called was called moderate phase moderate phase due to methods of works and demands put forward which were moderate in nature so moderates were not very um, uh, aggressive with their program they were moderate moderate matlab um, they they were not too harsh they were not too light so they were not too strict they were not too uh, lenient they were moderate okay so their methods of work were basically uh, that made them uh, be called as moderates they believed in essential sense of justice and goodness of the british rule okay and according to them the bureaucracy was the hurdle between indian people and their rights so therefore reform rather than expulsion of british rule was their aim so when uh, the moderates uh, never wanted initially they never at this point of time when they just formed about 1885 1886 they believed in the british sense of justice they believed in the goodness of british rule they did not want to expel the british rule british rule ko wo khatam nahi karna chahte they rather th they rather want reforms to be brought about changes to be brought about in the system aur unka unka manna tha ki bureaucracy jo hai jo political bureaucracy hai wo pareshani kar rahi hai between indian people aur unke rights ke beech mein so moderates wanted that bureaucracy should be reformed usme badlav aaye initially moderates did not want to expel the british rule they expressed opinions on all important measures of the government and protested against unpopular ones so sabse bada contribution moderates ka ye hai ki wo opinions public opinion jiski baat karte hain hum public public opinion means aapka kya uh, aapki kya soochbooj hai is cheez pe aapka kya opinion hai aap kya samajhte hain is particular issue ke bare mein so so they started to express their opinions they started to express their opinions and discuss those opinions among different people and they would protest among the unpopular steps of the government as an ek wo british government ko acha maan rahe hain to ye matlab nahi hai ki unke jo harsh measures hain usko wo protest nahi kar rahe they were also protesting against the unpopular ones they made extensive use of press to express their views and to educate public opinion तो वो लोगों में बातचीत कर रहे हैं अपने व्यूज को लिख रहे हैं एक्सप्रेस कर रहे हैं द क्रिएटिंग पब्लिक ओपिनियन लोगों को अब और एडिकेट कर रहे हैं उनको साक्षर बना रहे हैं कि ब्रिटिश का रूल का ये है ब्रिटिश रूल ये है सो दे आर ट्राइंग टू क्रिएट एन अवेयरनेस अबाउट द ब्रिटिश रूल सो मॉडरेट्स वर वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इन द वे दैट दे क्रिएटेड पब्लिक ओपिनियन दे एडिकेटेड इंडियन अबाउट द ब्रिटिश रूल and uh, hearing to some of their demands the british passed the indian council act of 1892 but this did not satisfy congress leaders eventually we know that in 1905 congress the moderates had demanded self rule or swaraj the biggest contribution the greatest contribution of moderates is the economic drain theory drain of wealth theory economic drain uh kyunki moderates jo early moderates the they were literate they were educated they were intelligent and they were they had an intellectual sense and they understood that british rule kya kar raha hai india mein british rule kyunki wo colonial rule hai it is interested in draining india india ko drain karne mein india ko exploit karne mein uska interest hai economically aarthik star pe it wanted to exploit india to fulfill its colonial ambitions so the biggest uh, contribution the greatest contribution of moderates is the economic uh, drain of india the theory of economic drain the economic critique of colonialism because britishers were trying to justify their rule they they were they were saying that india is backward they need somebody uh, britishers is, said that it is our mission to uh, uplift the uh, indians 
now um, the moderate said no it, they are colonial rule you know they are colonial power they are here for economic exploitation they are draining the wealth of india right so the biggest contribution of the moderates is the economic critique of colonialism which is in the drain of wealth theory right so they also proved to, uh, through their speeches writings that india's under development and poverty were due to british economic policies such as high land revenue destruction of indigenous industries import and promotion of foreign capital their demands included reduction of land revenue indianization of civil services abolition of salt tax so a uh, congress program was broad enough to accommodate all parties though the moderates belong to the urban educated middle class they did not represent their sectional interests right so you have to remember don't think of the congress at that point of time don't compare the congress of that point of time to the congress of today in 1885 an indian national congress was formed it was the only party it was the only uh, in fact it was the only political group at that point of time in india and it like i mind my point uh, 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 you know three of the slide the congress program was broad enough to accommodate all parties so it was a different kind of a congress it was a it was a formation it was a group it was a it, it was a collaboration of different parties you know who were fighting towards india's independence that was the clear purpose and um, they uh, although they belong to the middle class uh, but they never um, educated middle class but they never actually um, uh, fought for their own uh, urban uh, issues urban med uh, educated middle class issues they represented uh, they tried to represent and i wouldn't say that they completely represented but they tried to represent all uh, the sections of the society right our uh, kyunki ye educated middle class tha to wo apne speeches writings se india ki under development aur poverty ke bare mein jo british ke um, economic policies ke karan hua hai jaise land revenue humne kafi baat cheet ki hai pichle 5 6 lectures mein uh, indigenous industries ko khatam kar diya import kar rahe hain promotion kar rahe hain from foreign uh, capital iske karan jo economic drain ho raha hai india ka they tried to the moderates tried to highlight that showcase that to people through their writings and through their speeches and all so they made extensive use of press hum dekhenge ki jo shuruaat mein shuruaat ke daur mein jo press mein newspapers aur journals nikle the magazines nikalti thi wo uh, by and large moderate leaders ne shuruaat ki hai uski at this point of time 1885 se kuch about 1905 so um, press to educate uh, they used the extensive use of press to educate public opinion in india and in england so though the moderates put forward important demands before the government none of their demands were accepted so moderates did play a very important role in the way that they were putting their demands for betterment of india but britishers could not fulfill most of their demands now on the other hand uh, there was another group um, within the international congress jinki ideology or way of working different thing a group of people who were disillusioned with the moderates ideologies and methods their demands and advocated a more hostile attitude towards the british extremists ka ye manna tha ki normal baat cheet se a uh, normal baat cheet britishers se usse kaam nahi chalega there has to be more aggressive protest towards the british rule right so the extremist wanted to advocate they advocated more hostile attitude towards the british the social religious reform leaders and movements of the 19th century gave uh, impetus to political radicalism these political radicals derived inspiration from their traditional values and took pride in india's culture religion and polity so extremists were a very very radical politically radical form of group they believed in their own traditions they believed in their own the indian traditional values they took pride in india's culture and uh, with that kind of confidence they wanted to fight the british they did not want to just convince and appease and petition against a uh, uh, british rule or british power but it 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 advocated the extremist advocated a policy which was more aggressive more dynamic more radical to throw the british out of india
right? So extremists wanted to have relations with other countries on equal pedestal and believed in India's self-respect. Indians had to work for their own salvation in which the British had no contribution to make. They therefore, therefore fully opposed the moderates' ideology. So you can see that there is a very clear difference between the moderates and the extremists. They both were a part of Indian National Congress until the Surat split happened. We we'll talk about it later. But um, uh, when when you start, you know, thinking about Indian National Congress, you have to build, you have to you have to look at the moderates and extremists equally. Yeah. So let's try and see clearly what were the differences between the moderates and extremists. There was different in ideology and methods used. Yeah, but you will understand that their ideology, their ideology, their thoughts, and their methods, the practical implementation they were doing, were moderates and extremists were quite different. Extremists believed in the strength of the masses and their direct involvement in political participation, whereas moderates did not believe in mass uh, movements. Swaraj for extremists was not directed against foreign goods. But foreign habits, customs, manners, culture, etc. So they were very clear about their ideologies. Politics of moderates was mendicancy, but for extremists, it was open hostility to all forms of British rule, such as schools, court, jobs, goods, etc. So uh, uh, extremists were like, if we don't Britishers ko nahi chahte ki wo hamare ko rule kare, to hum directly unko bolenge ki hamen nahi chahiye aapke schools. We don't want to study in your schools. We don't want to study in your universities. We don't want your foreign clothes. So the, it was a direct attack on the British. The expression was direct. No, rather than the moderates who would petition, no, we want this right from you. We want this right from you. So basically, both of them, both the or moderates and extremists, had very different, very very different ways of uh, and perspective about um, uh, getting uh, independence from the Britishers. Uh, mutual distrust between moderates and extremists found its full expression in the Surat split. International Congress ki jab Surat mein meeting hui, uh, annual general meeting hui 1907 mein, Surat mein to maha pe moderates or extremists ke beech mein uh, split ho gaya, matlab alag ho gaye wo, in which extremists were expelled from the Congress. Post split, there was a lull of nationalist activity until the arrival of Gandhi and his assuming of leadership of the Congress. So 1907 to 1914, um, there was kind of lull in the activity. Lull means itni zada activities nahi ho rahi thi national movement mein. National movement um, uh, ek alag daur pakar liya, ek alag speed pakar li when Gandhi came from South Africa to India and he assumed the leadership of Congress in 1914. So this is broadly about the moderates, extremists, and the differences between moderates and extremists. Now let's quickly move to uh, 1885 to 1905 to 1907. Tak abhi, abhi, uh, kuch slides mein discussion kiya hai. by and large Indian National Congress ke baare mein baat ki. Uh, uh, Indian National Congress that means the moderates and extremists by and large. Now, when Gandhi came, let's see what happened. What were Gandhi and his thoughts? Uh, I wouldn't spend too much time on Gandhi and his movement because it's generally known and all of you would know most of it. Uh, of course, you have to read it. You have to learning material se isko bar bar padna hai, uh, because sometimes we don't know what we generally know, but we don't know what And as history students, we must always go back to our books, our authentic books, to read and clarify कि जो हमारी समझ है वो क्या हम सही हिस्टोरिकली हिस्टोरिकल पर्सपेक्टिव से समझ रहे हैं कि नहीं बिकॉज़ हिस्ट्री जो एक डिसिप्लिन है आई एम जस्ट डाइग्रेसिंग अ लिटिल बिट बट आई थिंक हिस्ट्री इज अ डिसिप्लिन इज सबसे ज्यादा उसके साथ खिलवाड़ भी होता है बिकॉज़ हम सबको लगता है कि हम इतिहास को जानते हैं एवरीबॉडी थिंक्स दैट दे नो हिस्ट्री यस दे डू नो हिस्ट्री बिकॉज़ इट्स ट्रैवलिंग थ्रू मेमोरी जो उनके दिमाग में डाला गया है जो ओवर पीरियड टाइम वो समझ रहे हैं वो 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 सिर्फ वो ही वो ही चीज जानते हैं बट इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट हम बहुत चीजें गलत जानते हैं जब हम किताबें पढ़ते हैं तो हम जानते हैं अच्छा ये है हिस्टोरिकली सही 
सो इट्स वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट दैट अगर हम हमें अपॉर्चुनिटी मिली है हिस्ट्री पढ़ने की तो उसको हम ढंग से तरीके से हिस्टोरिकल परस्पेक्टिव से पढ़ें तो इन इनफैक्ट हम गांधी के बारे में भी बहुत कुछ जानते हैं पर अगर हम गांधी के बारे में सिर्फ अपनी दिमाग से जानेंगे हम पढ़ेंगे नहीं उसको और वहां से इंफॉर्मेशन नहीं लेंगे तो बहुत कुछ हम गलत भी जानेंगे गांधी के बारे में सो विच इज विच इज नॉट विच इज नॉट गुड सो लेट्स गो बैक टू आर बुक्स अगेन एंड अगेन लेट्स गो बैक टू अथेंटिक सोर्सेज यू नो गुड बुक्स ऑन हिस्ट्री एंड ट्राई एंड अंडरस्टैंड हिस्ट्री फ्रॉम देर Yes. So let's go back to our Gandhi mass, Gandhian mass movement. Gandhi and his thoughts. Now, Gandhi uh, during Gandhi's stay in uh, Gandhi ji's stay in South Africa, uh, which was from about 1893 to 1914. That's the time Gandhi was in South Africa. He developed the method of passive resistance or civil disobedience, which he named as Satyagraha. So, ये जो concept है Satyagraha का जो Gandhi ने India में apply kiya in the national movement it was it had already um, framed uh, gandhi had already conceived and framed this in south africa but south africa mein bhi um, racism or kafi uh, kuch wahan bhi movements chal rahi thi aur wahan gandhi was very active he was a, a lawyer by profession and he was very very active so he actually um, um, uh, developed these methods of passive resistance civil disobedience which he named as satyagraha back then in south africa only he believed in careful training of disciplined cadres non violent satyagraha involved peaceful violation of specific laws readiness of negotiation now another very important point you will see that gandhi's principle he was very strict with satyagraha or non violent uh, non violence satyagraha non violence passive resistance negotiation compromise discipline these were things that gandhi was very strict about so if britishers said okay let's negotiate let's compromise on this gandhi we will give you this he would stop his movement and um, go for that conference or negotiation but if Uh, uh his um uh, if uh, if it did not work well for india in terms of if whatever was asked by the indian leaders or was expected by gandhi from britishers if britishers did not fulfill that then he would come back from that meeting and conference come back from that negotiation and again restart his meeting uh, restart his uh, movement so gandhi in politics some of the principles of gandhi in politics in fact most of the principles of gandhi are quite evident in the practical implementation of the movements that he brought in india so gandhi ko samajhna jitna aasan hai utna hi mushkil but mai kahungi ki it it is quite easy if you understand the basic principles on which gandhi had lived his life so he was ready for negotiation he was always ready for negotiation and compromise and dialogue it was a part of his political strategy he supported the varna system though he rejected the caste system he fought for hindu muslim unity all through his life he opposed industrial revolution and large scale industries his idea of industrial revolution was very very different rather he believed in the concept of uh, uh, cottage industries you know he believed in the concept of trusteeship theory which harmonized and promoted amicable relations between capitalists and the working class and his concept of sarvodaya it meant greatest good for all which should be the objective of the state so these are other um, the, these are some of the uh, thoughts of gandhi that uh, you know i wanted to share with you now the early beginnings of the gandhian phase uh, when gandhi came to india from about 1914 to 1917 uh, in fact 1918 le lijiye 1914 to 18 in char saal mein jo early phase tha gandhian uh, politics ka usme gandhi ne kya kiya first experiment in satyagraha which gandhi did was in 1917 in champaran bihar where indigo peasants were protesting against european planters and the bad mill strike 1918 gandhi supported gandhi intervened on the side of workers and secured 35% increase in wages hunger strike as a weapon for protest was used here for the first time right so these were some of the early experiments some of the early interventions that gandhi did in india and let me tell you that gandhi when he came to india for the first 2 3 years he just traveled across india to understand the ground reality of what people are facing 
or what people want from the British. Right? In 1918, he uh, started the Kheda Satyagraha. In support of peasants, he involved in uh, a no revenue campaign against British authorities. And he founded the Satyagraha Sabha in 1919 to protest against the Rollet Act. So you see 1917, 1918, 1919, um, uh, 19, until all of these years, uh, 1914 to 17, I told you when he came to India, he was just walking throughout India to just understand that what is the ground reality, right? So let's understand now uh, the non-cooperation movement. Dr. Shaheen has already spoken a bit about it. I'm going to just uh, read out the main points of the non-cooperation movement. Now, there were two main movements that, bore, that were that were born out of the two major issues, that is Khilafat issue and the reaction towards oppressive policies of British government, which is economic cause that is that included rise of prices, rise of taxation, taxation, ruin nation of the Indian artisans. So uh, non-cooperation movement and Khilafat movement, these two no movements, Gandhi ne saath me leke chala, chale. Or uh, Khilafat movement particularly because uh, Gandhi thought that it is the best opportunity for Indians to, uh, for Muslims and Hindus, um, in fact, all sections of society to unite under the non-cooperation movement. So the program was to boycott the British courts, schools, colleges, and the resignation from government offices. It was also participation of several sectors of society. It was It was spectacular the way peasants, students, women participated in large number. For the first time, uh, the, the, the vastness of the movement um, that uh, uh, was brought about by non-cooperation movement by Gandhi was phenomenal. Hmm? Violent incidents uh, against policemen in Chauri Chaura caused Gandhiji to unilaterally, unilaterally suspend the movement. Now, as I told you, Gandhi was very strict about some principles that he had formulated for India. And these were things that he lived his life by. So um, uh, he was against violence. The moment at Chauri Chaura police station, some of the protesters um, uh, 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 burned the police station, and it was there was a lot of violence that happened in that uh, in that area. Gandhiji revoked in the sense it it it, it stopped the non-cooperation movement, then it suspended the non-cooperation movement. So this had really surprised many nationalists and revolutionaries because they never thought Gandhi would really at the at the peak of the um, uh, of the national movement at this point of time the non cooperation movement Gandhi suspended it so it was a huge shock for the nationalists but what comes out from this is that Gandhi's non violence theory or satyagraha was very very it was a very powerful strategy which Gandhi and himself understood. Uh, its significance. People were still not able to understand the significance of it. And that's the reason it surprised this particular incident when Gandhi had uh, suspended the movement, had really uh, shocked the nationalists. But uh, we will see that what, what the main significance of non-cooperation movement was that it extended nationalism to those areas which had remained outside the fold of national movement until now. So the first time we see mass movement happening when the non-cooperation movement was there now uh, another significant um, uh, uh, movement that Gandhi had brought in was the civil disobedience movement. So all of these movements are mass movements, where the participation of people are from across the different sections. So appointment of all British uh, Indian Statutory Commission um, um, to recommend further constitutional reforms for India. The commission uh, did not have any Indian member. Calcutta session of Congress 1928 demanded dominion status within a year. If not accepted by British, the Gandhi would launch civil disobedience movement. In 1929, Karachi session. So when I think sessions, these are international Congress sessions. The international Congress changed its objective to complete independence and authorized Gandhi to launch the civil disobedience movement. So these the first two points are basically the precursors, the, the main events before Gandhi had started the civil disobedience movement. Again, it was to do with uh, the Indian National Congress bargaining with uh, the, uh, the Britishers for some of the other, um, uh, you know, uh, their demands, like uh, they wanted dominion status in 1928. And by 1929, um, Congress had demanded complete independence, but uh, Britishers were not giving that to the Indian leaders. So uh, then Gandhi decided to launch the civil disobedience movement. 
Gandhi hit upon the idea of breaking salt laws as salt manufacturing was a government monopoly and a salt tax was levied on Indians which Gandhi considered the most oppressive form of taxation. After Gandhi march in 1930 which lasted for 25 days he broke the salt laws and launched the civil disobedience movement so look at gandhi's um, uh, method you know he focused on namak as as small or as big as a commodity as salt yeah salt which is so important for in for our food so important and it is a it is a basic necessity but we were paying tax on that and to produce salt the production of salt only state could do it was a monopoly of state and gandhi thought that this is oppressive so it broke the salt law salt tax to just uh, protest against the salt tax so um, uh, he began the civil disobedience movement by breaking the salt tax by producing uh, doing dandi march and producing the salt himself so that meant that you are questioning the authority so his movement was Uh, in a way um, uh, uh, if you if you can see uh, very moderate but very powerful in its impact yeah apart from salt laws the forest laws no revenue campaign no rent campaign boycott of british manufactured goods picketing of liquor shop etc took place in several parts of country under the civil disobedience movement now in 1931 the gandhi irwin pact was um, uh, signed and it suspended the civil disobedience movement and confirmed the participation of the congress in the second round table conference which took place in london now because this conference was a failure a uh, failure of this conference where after gandhi's return to india he resumed the civil disobedience movement and by declaring um, but by now congress was declared unlawful and press was restricted and arrested all leaders national leaders including gandhi so if you remember i have shared this point briefly in my last lecture yesterday's lecture when i was talking about press that how uh, uh, the 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 um, under under one of the uh, uh, legal um, uh, press uh, acts uh, emergency acts congress was declared unlawful in about 1931 and uh, all the congress leaders were taken as prisoners gandhi was taken as a prisoner and um, uh, uh, was arrested and um, congress was declared unlawful so this was what the civil disobedience movement was so there was an extensive participation compared to non cooperation movement there was even more participation in the civil disobedience movement and the movement further deepened the spread of nationalism it was extensive participation from rural india hindu muslim unity although was absent and this was because um, uh, uh, now you you can see you will see that um, the demand uh, of the muslim league and the demand for um, the, for their own state had started to you know take place a uh, boycott of british goods was particularly a success, success uh, uh, under the civil disobedience movement now the quit india movement uh, was closer to the second world war now let's understand and quit india movement if you see was also um, a, a result of a lot that was happening in the world at this point of time uh, the, the viceroy of india announced the participation of india in the world war 2 right without consulting indians themselves the international congress passed a resolution to offer support conditionally asked for independence in return that international congress said that okay we will support british in his, in their for their um, uh, indian army would su support british uh, in world war 2 but britishers must give india independence after the war and this was not entertained by the british government right so to gain support of indians uh, viceroy made an offer called the august offer in 1940 which also did not satisfy congress because august offer did not offer india's independence so gandhi started the individual disobedience movement to bring pressure on the british government and thousands of satyagrahis were arrested so when i say individual um, uh, disobedience movement of gandhi it means that every individual would be uh following the method of civil disobedience so they were called the satyagrahis who were doing this individual disobedience um, and there were uh, uh, thousands of these satyagrahis across india were arrested when gandhi started individual civil disobedience movement
Now, as far as drawing closer to India, as war was drawing, the World War II was drawing closer to India, um, a British government in London sent Sir Stafford Cripps to India to negotiate a deal with the Indian political parties so as to gain support for British. So British wanted India, um, Indian soldiers to support in their war, uh, in their war efforts. But um, uh, India was not ready because India did not want to support British because British was not ready to give India independence after that. So this mission again, Cripps mission was a failure. It did not offer complete independence. Therefore, Indian National Congress passed a resolution to launch massive civil disobedience and demanded complete independence immediately so that India could defend herself. So the International Congress now thought that nothing doing. We don't want anything from Britishers. We just want them to leave India, quit India. We want complete independence. If, and if they can't do this, we will launch a movement. Immediately after quit India resolution was passed, all nationalists, including Gandhi, were arrested. And therefore, the movement became leaderless there was a massive demonstration, protest, strikes all over the country. So, um, in fact, Quit India movement was not that uh, non-violent also. It became very violent because the leaders were arrested. There were massive protests. There were strikes all over the country. And people also thought that now the, the, the slogan of Quit India would stir them, thinking that now the Britishers would go. So people would do everything to fight for their independence at this point of time. So there was a, a massive movement and it, it turned out to be violent, but it, it was a massive movement, the last push that Indians gave uh, for to fight for their independence. So the unique feature of Quit India movement was the overthrow of local administration and setting up of parallel governments in several parts of the country. So like I said, because now people thought that the Britishers will go, so they have set up their local administration, which was the Britishers rule, they have attacked it, they have removed it, and they have set up their government there, and they have set up their governance there. Um, uh, established key. So they were setting up of parallel governments in se several parts of the country. Peasants and the rural, rural masses were very, very active. There were mass detentions, arrests, and fines were initiated by the British government to suppress the protesters. In many places, army had to be called out to impose government control, total ban on freedom of press and civil li the liberties. So you see, there was so much of suppression British had to do because the movement had reached another level altogether. Muslims, however, remained aloof as the demand for Pakistan had picked up. And the patriotism of Indians was in full display. It had also seeped into the armed forces. Uh, so we see that in the armed forces also, there were a lot of uh, mutinies and rebellions uh, that British had to face, not only from the civil population, uh, but also from the uh, armed uh, forces. Extensive participation of students, women, working classes, peasants and rural masses. Some parties did not support the movement, however. Okay, now let's quickly move to the third uh, unit of this particular block, which is on communal politics. So if you remember my last slide, um, you know, the fifth point when I said Muslims remained aloof as the demand for Pakistan had picked up. So by about 1940s, there was already clearly uh, um, demand for a separate state that had started. But uh, let's understand what was this, what was the background to the demand of Pakistan? Uh, before we come to what uh, happened in the 1940s, which is the post Second World War development, let's see what was the background to the demand for Pakistan. So I have about uh, uh, six points in this particular um, uh, slide. Uh, the demand was a result of political development after 1937 election. So there's a lot of detail that I'm going to just read. You can just understand while I'm reading. I'm not going to explain too much because there's a lot of event details and description. So let's try and relate these events together. The demand was a result of political developments after 1937 elections. Muslim League fared poorly in this elections and won only 28% of Muslim votes. In order to expand their base, they resorted to grave communal politics by raising the slogan, Islam in danger. Demand for Pakistan, that is a separate homeland for Muslims, was made in 1940 Lahore session of the Muslim League, where the Lahore revolution was passed that demanded a sovereign state of Pakistan 
used in Jinnah's two nation theory. So you see from 1937 onwards, when 1937 when the first general elections took place and uh, uh, and um, uh, Muslim League had not got a lot of votes. In fact, it had really fared very poorly. And uh, because it, it wanted to take control, you know, it, uh, it there was a lot of uh, violence and communal politics that uh, it, it ventured into uh, by raising the slogan Islam in danger. And uh, by 1940, the Muslim League session, Lahore session, um, it, it said that, you know, there's nothing that we want. We want uh, uh, the Lahore revolution was based on the two nation theory that uh, um, India is not the place for Muslims and Muslims must have a separate state. And they wanted to call that as Pakistan. So two nation theory uh, concept, uh, the concept of two nation theory started to uh, pick up uh, um, majorly by 1940. The Hindu communal organization also too fared uh, poorly in the elections in 1937. So by 1937, we will see there are a lot of parties that are there now. There's Muslim League, there's Congress, there's Hindu Mahasabha. And there were, um, so there were communal organizations that had already begun. The Hindu community organization in form of Hindu Mahasabha, the Muslim community organization in terms of Muslim with the name Muslim League. So they were all, uh, however, in 1937 elections, they fared very poorly. And like their Muslim counterparts, they also resorted to politics of hatred and fear and demanded India to be a Hindu Raj. So you see, it was not only Muslim League, but even the Hindu communal organizations were um, uh, resorting to orthodox communal violent activities. They wanted Hindu Raj. So basically, very clearly, communal politics had uh, taken a very bad shape um, at this point of time in 1940s. The British government, on their part, who actively pursued the policy of divide and rule, but British anyway understood by 1940s that India want them to leave. So their last resort was like, let's divide and rule. Let's, uh, let's uh, help Muslim League. And then let's sometimes let's uh, help the Hindu communal group. So it was playing politics on divide and rule. They accepted, the British government accepted the Muslim League's position that the League should be recognized as the sole representative of the Muslims. So very smartly, the British accepted that, ha ha, yes, um, the Muslim League is the right representative of Muslims. And they should be uh, accepted as sole representatives of Muslims. Yes. Congress demanded, however, for independence was the countered by government that first Hindus and Muslims must to an agreement on how power was to be transferred before the process ever began. So um, uh, Congress wanted that both uh, Hindus and Muslims, at least they should come to an agreement. And then how the division would happen will be a separate thing, but at least let them come to a division, uh, come to an agreement. The Crips mission plan of 1942 brought Pakistan through the back door when it gave provinces the right to reject any future constitution that would be framed and they were also given the right to sign individual agreements with the British government. Now, uh, post uh, the Second World War, uh, which is about 1942, 1945-46, what, what happened? Where did the uh, 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 what was the development of uh, for uh, the uh, towards the partition and towards the separate uh, state of Pakistan? At the initiative of Viceroy Lord Wavell, prominent leaders of Congress and League were invited to Shimla to resolve the deadlock. The Shimla conference also broke down because Jinnah's insistence that only the Muslim League had the right to nominate Muslims to the Executive Council of the Viceroy. In the elections of 1945-46, Muslim League made a clean sweep of the Muslim votes, indicating their popularity among the masses. So after 1937 elections, the 1945 elections, Muslim did uh, get a lot of votes from the, um, the Muslim League got a lot of votes from the Muslim votes, Muslim people. The cabinet mission plan 1946 came to India to work out the constitutional arrangements for transfer of power. It believed that a separate Pakistan was unviable. Yes, and therefore worked to safeguard interests of Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, so cabinet mission really thought that Pakistan is an unviable option and it's, it's not possible to separate the state. But provinces were placed under three groups and each group was free to frame its own constitution. A province could leave the group to which it was assigned after a certain time. After 10 years, it could demand to modify group constitution. 
the soon differences uh, became very difficult between uh, Indian National Congress and Muslim League over the manner of placing of the provinces and groups and um, you know a lot of other things and I'm going to skip all, all these details please read it from your e-learning uh, e-learning e material uh, soon after there was an interim government that was suggested uh, 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 by the cabinet mission, according to which Nehru was its head. Um, Muslim League decided to boycott and uh, it did not send its uh, uh, representative in the interim government. Now, it was very frustrating for the Muslim League because there was no declaration on Pakistan until about 1946. So Jinnah resorted to direct action day in August 1946. And this is mass, mass brutal killings that happened in Calcutta, unleashing a communal hatred, which was uh, retaliated in several brutal manners by Hindu communities. So it was ma massive violence that happened in Calcutta in 1946. Uh, then British Prime Minister Attlee uh, decided to declare February 1947, uh, sorry, 30th, 1948 as um, the time that the date that was decided was India would, Britishers would withdraw from India, but and it appointed Mountbatten, um, you know, Lord Mountbatten to effect the transfer of power. Uh, June 3rd plan, please look at it. There were two dominions that were suggested India and Pakistan, but how they will be partitioned, um, the borders and all would be told later. Boundary Commission was established, so we know Sir Radcliffe and all uh, was appointed and. Um, uh, it uh, would, it, but it would announce the the terms of the awards of the uh, of the of the uh, of the boundary demarcation only after the partition. So there was a lot of communal violence, both on both sides, when partition happened. Now partition, why partition? There are many views on why this partition really took place. One view suggests that Congress leaders had succumbed to temptations of power and agreed to partition India. The basic reason for partition was the failure of the Congress in cautioning growing communalization in India, especially after 1937. So I told you that it was only by, from 1937 to 1947, these 10 years were, they were like bloody years for India. And because there was a lot of violence, communal violence that had taken place. So one view from the historians is that Congress did not check this communalization in India that, that took a fast pace in the 10 years from 1940, 1947. Uh, there's also a, 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 a perspective that Indian National Congress failed to bring Muslim masses into the mainstream national movement. The Indian National Congress was not able to formulate a long-term strategy to fight communalism, both politically and ideology. So uh, Congress is being blamed. Um, uh, Congress was blamed for uh, partition and that it could, did not um, really um, bring the Muslim masses in the national movement. But uh, however, there's still discussions on partitions. Many more, many histories have been written on partitions. Many books have been written on partition. Why did partition happen? What was the need of partition? Who is to be blamed? Who is not to be blamed? All of that. So. Maybe we'll have another lecture on that some other day. My last uh, 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 discussion will be on, yes, the independence happened, the sad, the tragic partition happened. And then how did India became a democratic country? You know, making of the democratic constitution, the evolution of democracy in India. Now, the demand for democratic and representative institution was made first made by early nationalists such as Ram Ra Mohan Roy. So we know that India, uh, the principles of the scientific uh, Western principles of democracy, rationalism, you know, uh, nas uh, all of this had started to be made in the 19th century only with Raja Ram Mohan Roy suggesting some of this um, in his uh, uh, discourses under Brahma Samaj. This demand uh, lacked uh, however, in any revolutionary will and was confined to a tiny section of educated people. So the demand of nationalist and democracy and representative institution did not really become a big uh, 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 matter. And it was confined to some discussions within educated uh, among the uh, tiny educated, tiny sections of educated people. Introduction of Western education in India was the most impactful step in the growth of democracy in India. Both moderates and extremists further spread their sense of democracy, liberalism through activities of the Congress and by the demands raised to the British. So I'm not talking just about uh, 1947. Ke baat kya ho. I'm taking you back to a 19th 
early 20th century that what were the developments then uh, which uh, were already being done preparing india preparing the leaders leaders are already thinking about what will be my india be what my india will be after its independence so leaders started did not start only thinking about india and how india would be after 1947 Yes, they worked on a constitution for two and a half years, almost three years. But they had started to think about it from way before. Yes, so Morley Minto reforms of 1909 permitted indirect elections for the first time. Successive acts such as Government of India Act 1919, 1935 extended franchise to a restricted class of people. So constituent assembly, though represented various shades of opinion, was elected on a very restricted franchise. It worked as India's first parliament also until the first general elections. So uh, fundamental rights were declared as one of the most sacred part of the constitution, where the individuals were regarded as the basic legal unit. Every individual in India can question the court of law if his or her fundamental right is under. question uh, uh, is under threat so in this way har ek insaan ek basic legal unit ban jata hai usme wo itni power hai ki wo court of law ko hila sakta hai kyunki uski fundamental right jo hai us pe uh, us, usko threat hai us pe asar hua hai ha directive principles of state policy were declared to be fundamental but not enforceable by any court so you see the the the, the points and the uh, the the Uh, how this democratic constitution would be uh, the the thinking process and um, uh, you know the the um, mind at work was already there much before 1947 and it took its formal form once the constituent assembly was made and of course when the constitution was being drafted um, from 1947 onwards um democratic state structures now what are these democratic state structures the parliamentary system of governance was in the such where there would be collective responsibility of the executive that is the council of ministers to the legislature institution of presidency were merely nominal so we know that india has a parliamentary system and it has borrowed this from uk um United Kingdom, where there is a parliamentary system of governance uh isme kya hota hai ki there is a council of ministers collective body at the center and that is the heading under the prime minister the uh, uh, prime minister heads this collective body or uh, ek not one person is responsible for any kind of a wrong thing that has happened that would be ha- that would happen it would be a collective responsibility of the executives council of ministers and they were responsible to the legislature legislature means the lok sabha and the rajya sabha and at the center and uh, in yes we do have presidential form of governance also which we have taken it from america us uh, but the institution of presidency has major function but it is largely nominal and formal at the state level when it comes to our state level uh, moving from the center the real executive power is vested in the chief minister by the virtue of his position as the leader of the majority party in the legislature however jo governor ki position hai in different states it's a major uh, debate and a major bone of con- contention we know that what are the functions of um, uh, uh, and duties of the governor but yes the role of governor is being debated and is a bone of contention that we see uh, by and large uh, and we also see that in you know now also when there is a problem in the governor's resigning or you know so there are a lot of issues around the role of a governor as the representative system of the government was introduced universal franchise uh, became more significant towards democratization process further strengthened the caste class authority in terms of economic power social position so basically the universal franchise and then adult universal franchise was the backbone of india's democracy where every person every adult above the year of 18 years or has a right to vote so it strengthened the caste class authority it strengthened people's economic social political authority it gave voices to various sections yes so in india a federal form of government with a unitary essence constitution provides innumerable provisions by which center and a strong ruling party could easily infringe upon powers of federating units so there's also uh, yes we have uh, um, governance at two levels there's a union government the central government and there is state government 
but the constitution also gives more powers to this uh, to the central government so it is called if you look at the preamble it says union of states union of states that means states are there the many states in india yes but they are all together because of a union which is a union government so sometimes um, the union government or the central government does infringe on the rights or uh, does interfere in uh, the powers of the federating units which is the state powers the administrative and financial structure of indian states its economy and its organization leads to strengthening of centralized political structure resources for various development plans in agriculture industry initially we used to be uh, there was a planning commission that was established in march 1950 and um, uh, funds and uh, economic plans and financial and administrative structures were coming through the planning commission bureaucracy in india largely existed as a legacy of the colonial rule the role of paramilitary forces like the crpf bsf cisf is instrumental in strengthening centralized power, political power structures in india so these were uh, the many other points uh, that i wanted to discuss under our democratic constitution but these are uh, broad um, uh, uh, you know uh, points that i thought of highlighting when i'm discussing um, uh the the uh, the democratic constitution so by and large if i take back to my slide second slide we tried to cover uh the four topics which is about moderates extremists then we moved to the gandhian movements then we understood that where was this political polit communal politics emerging and how it led to partition of india and then after partition you know uh, how india was drawing in its um, drawing from the past and created many uh, new um, principles uh, of base which were the basis for a democratic constitution the making of the democratic constitution of india so i think i will uh, stop here and uh, try and uh, you know see if there is any question and i'll hand it over to dr shaheen who can um, uh, you know comment and ask if there's any question okay thank you so much thank you so much ma'am for uh, giving uh, a nice explanation uh, about uh, all the segments of our uh, topic uh, the moderates the extremists the role of gandhi the civil disobedience movement non cooperation movement the quit india movement and lastly about partition of india and the making of the democratic uh, constitution democratic country so now i am uh, requesting our students uh, vivekananda acharya do you have any question if you have any question please write down in your chat box or you can uh, directly ask your question to ma our ma'am hello 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 manoranjan mohanty i think they both of them did not have any question okay we we can answer you saying you know okay so finally we uh, india got uh, its the uh, indian independence act and uh, partition of india uh, the indian independence act uh, passed by the british parliament in july 1947 which provided for the setting up of two independent dominion of uh, uh, india and pakistan with effect from 15 august 1947 so here is was the partition of india inevitable and uh, unavoidable yes uh, the answer of this question that is differ widely with the nationality of the writers that is india pakistan or the british so in india the partition of the country is uh, considered a tragedy it is projected as the logical culmination of the long standing british policy of divide and rule and the muslim league ideology of communalism and uh, separateness so the two worked together and forced the indian national congress to agree to the partition of india 
and indian writers largely placed the blame at the door of the congress leader and agreed that if they had shown adequate understanding tact and boldness the partition of the motherland could be avoided and in pakistan however the partition is considered as quite logical and inevitable and the growth of muslim nationalism is traced in the depth of indian history so among the british scholars there is no unanimity of opinion about the rationale of the partition of india and there is difference of opinion among the historians and those writers who served the raj in india so whatever the work did of history credit must be given to uh, m a jinna for his uh, adroit handling of the political situation and he was a very shrewd politician and uh, often dodged his political rival by clever somersaults and he rose from strength to strength and earned the epithet of qadir e azan that is the great organizer so jawaharlal nehru attributed the growth of muslim communalism to the delay in the growth of a strong muslim middle class and this enabled the league to work up the psychology the psychology that is uh, among the emotionally excitable muslim masses so the cry of islam in danger and uh, which has brought the muslim masses under the banner of the league and mr jinna stood forth as the political masiha so here all said that the act of uh, omission and commission on the part of the hindu mahasabha further framed the fanatism of the muslim league and uh, the mr b d savarkar who is the president of mahasabha advocated an uncompromising doctrine of hindu ascendancy and openly announced that the only way to deal with the hindu muslim sikh sikhism was to insist that all india was hindustan and that the muslims must reconcile themselves to the status of minority to the status of a minority community in a democratic state which orders life by majority rule so with this i am concluding uh, this session but uh, at the last i am requesting to professor patit pawan mishra sir to tell something or to give some madam there is a question i think there is a question there is a question i think uh, by uh, aparna oh, acha oh, oh, um, yes yes okay. ha uh, aparna biswas is asking did gandhi support creation of pakistan so should i answer yes. or does professor mishra want to take this question yes ma'am i will answer okay sir please answer okay thank you very much dr sain yes. and i must i must congratulate mrs sikhi deo for covering such a vast topic in one hour and not leaving any point then i must thank to sign for giving a short resume on partition as far as the responsibility of part uh, creation of pakistan is concerned we can't say that x is responsible or y is responsible it is the amalgamation of many forces whether you talk of jinna or congress or the british policy of divide and rule gandhi ji in his heart never wanted partition he even went to the extent of saying that jinnah should be the premier of new indian subcontinent but nobody listened to him so we cannot say that gandhi was responsible for partition that is the answer to aparna's question and as far as responsibility of jinnah is concerned actually jinnah was leader of the indian muslims he was the unchallenged leader nobody was there to challenge jinnah and he took upon himself as the leader of the indian muslims but we should remember that also there were many indian muslims who did not want partition i can cite the example of khan abdul ghafar khan then the congress leader molana abul kalam azad then earlier baduddin taytiyar ji so many indian muslims they stayed in india after pakistan sorry after partition 
thinking that India is their own nation or other land. So we cannot blame a particular group, whether it is Hindus or Muslims, for partition. But here I should point out that it was the British devious diplomacy that was responsible with their divide and rule policy. The British, they had taken India as the jewel in the British crown, and it was a fact. Then the question arises, why they left India in 1947? Why India got independence? Many people attribute the role of Mahatma Gandhi, his mass movement, his satyagraha, his unrelenting, unrelenting struggle against the British colonialism. Of course, we cannot deny the role of Gandhi. But there were other leaders, like Subhash Bose. Then there was the Indian Naval Mutiny in 1946. These sectors were also responsible for India getting independence. And the most important th thing of Indian independence is the world situation. By highlighting this point, I am not I mean, minimizing the role of Indian leaders of the Congress Party or the Indian revolutionaries. But after 1945, after the end of the Second World War, the balance of power in world politics had changed completely. The glory of British Empire was not there. The glory of British Empire was not there. It, though it was a victorious party, Winston Churchill lost the election. Britain was suffering economically, and it was not possible on the part of Britain to hold Indian Empire. That's why they withdrew their forces from Greece also at this time. So the world situation and onset of Cold War was one of the major reasons for India getting independence. So with this, I must thank Mrs. Tripti Deo for taking 10 classes and myself, history faculty and OECU is very grateful to her and we hope that in future also she will help us in these virtual classes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for giving an opportunity to me that I could interact, uh, not so much interact because this virtual medium, medium doesn't help us interact too much with our uh, students and you know fellow colleagues. Uh, and I miss that. But I completely enjoyed uh, uh, taking uh, these lectures and with my limited uh, understanding of the different subjects, I hope I could deliver uh, so, and some um, aspects of uh, you know the history issues, different issues in history that we've covered. So thank you so much. And um, I think uh, if there is any question, I keep saying that you could write me a mail and uh, I can answer those questions uh, in whatever language, English, Hindi or Uriya, and I can uh, I can write in the same language and send it to you. And uh, yes, so please take care. Please be safe and uh, study history from good books, authentic books, and keep reading history because we tend to forget what we read and we have to keep understanding and reading um, uh, what is uh, right and what is authentic rather than thinking that, oh, this was said and this is what it is. So thank you so much and take care, all of you. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nakhar. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Nakhar. Thank you. Thank you, Rudra.